All right. Yeah. So um, could could you introduce yourself and what you do with Amazon? Sure. I'm Michael Willett. Uh, I run the World Experience team at Amazon Game Studios working on New World, and we're responsible for basically the world. So all the zones, the POIs, uh, the encounter setups, uh, also responsible for housing and a whole bunch of stuff that you do running around. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of stuff to do, it seems like. Um, so New World launched this week and it seems like uh, congratulations are in order for a pretty st- uh, strong launch. Uh, I, I don't remember the, the latest numbers on Steam, but there was many hundreds of thousands of players. That's correct. Uh, I think it was an insane amount. And that, that's probably hyperbole for me, but uh, <laughs> it, it was impre- it was impressive and we're we're very happy. I was very happy that uh, there's so many people getting to experience and, and, and play with us and join us in a tournum. It looks like on, well, yesterday it hit a peak of 734,000 players, which was, which is a lot of players for, for concurrent players on steam. Um, so tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, the story behind new world. This has been in development quite a long time. Um, I don't remember the exact figure, but a number of years and, uh, it's finally, finally launched. So, uh, you know, your involvement on the game, when did you start with it, uh, with, with Amazon games and kind of what's been the, the journey? Sure. Um, I started in Amazon games. I want to say the fall of 2013 leading into 2014, uh, I was part of an acquisition. So, uh, I worked at double helix games and I was the lead producer on killer instinct. And, uh, right after that, I, I joined up at Amazon. And so I've worked on tons of different projects since I've been here, uh, all interesting, just different takes, uh, different explorations on types of multiplayer games. And then in 2017, I want to say, I joined uh, the New World team. And then I would say, what was it? Over those couple of years, I had various roles, uh, developing different things, producing different features. And then I wound up taking over the World team uh, several years back. and as you might have known, like we started more towards like a survival kind of game, like an open world survival game with lots of players. Um, but through the years of, of ingesting tons of just player feedback and what people really enjoyed about the game, we started changing vectors and really honing in on kind of what the game is today and experiencing this supernatural island where you have like this mixture of, of these solid MMO tropes. Uh, but also with this deep crafting system that you'd find in in different types of survival games. And then this rich third person action combat system as well. And they all kind of like mesh very well together. Yeah, that's what I've played some of the game and I I did notice the, um, the emphasis on survival game elements, which I thought was interesting Um, because those, you know, MMOs were really popular, you know, you know, World of Warcraft and, and for a while MMOs were kind of the big thing. And and nowadays, what's interesting about, you know, the timing of New World's launch is that MMOs are not quite as center stage as they used to be. But survival games have gotten really popular. So how how did you blend the two, you know, the elements of an MMORPG with, sur- with sort of that survival um, genre? Well, a lot of things that we thought about was we don't want to lose progress. Like we, we want progression to be meaningful. So like all the cool gear that you've acquired, like we didn't want people to lose that and, and have to go hunt for it. We, we wanted people's time to be rewarded. So we, we looked at just different vectors on like how, how can we bring those things together with synergy and make it feel really good. So that's when we just start experimenting and, and just moving forward saying like, oh, it's really cool to like still place camps in the world and have those as like respawn points. So like, you know, you're outside of a big POI, you can make sure like, oh, you know what, this might be a bit dangerous. At least I have a place to go back to. And then I can also do part of my preparation loop at that camp. So it's like, hey, I'm running low on on potions or I need some more meals. I can just craft them right here out in the field instead of having to go back to a major settlement or something like that. So like that example, we just started looking at for like, like what are those nice loops in the gameplay that really like come and work well together? So, um, you know, alongside that sort of survival elements, um, what would you say, like 
for for New World, it being you know uh, many many years after the launch of something like World of Warcraft, but even something like Final Fantasy XIV, uh, what what kind of separates this game from from older MMOs? Um, you know, other, I, we've already talked a little bit about you know the survival elements, but what else? What else is new? Like what 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 have you guys done to sort of push the genre and do do uh, new and different things? Well, I for me, combat was so much different than what I'd experienced in the past. And I really like the, our style of third person action combat uh, because you have to actively dodge and block. And the way our hit registration works is it gets validated on the server. Um, so when, when you're attacking someone's head or you're backstabbing, you're going to get like a reaction um, similar to what you do in any third person like action game. But then it's the scale at which we do it. So it's like we have 50 v 50 wars. So we have large scale wars that take place where people are trying to fight over a territory. That's so they can claim it as their own. Uh, and then you have uh, opt in PVP out in the world. So people are fighting over forts. That's so they can get bonuses and increase their influence to get a chance to fight for those territories. So we have a type of scale that's unique to this style of combat since it's not tab targeting. Uh, and then you couple that with the way that we've built the world with super long draw distances. If you can see something, more than likely you can get to it. That's cool. Um, tell me about how, like, housing and and sort of player ownership of the of of you know regions or whatever. How does that work exactly? So you can actually buy a house anywhere, uh, but it depends on what faction or company owns that that territory would influence like how much you would pay on your upkeep. So they could be benevolent and say like, Oh, you know, no taxes. It's really cheap to live here. If you want to craft goods here, it's also inexpensive. Or they could be tyrants and say like, no, everything's extreme. It's going to cost you if you want to live in this territory. And in those cases, you might want to overthrow them and try to get reductions in those costs. Um, but it, it, with the housing, you need to hit a certain threshold of standing. Uh, so they, you want to be like uh, someone who's known in the territory, and that's by just accomplishing feats or or gathering or crafting and doing things within that zone. And once you get to a certain uh, level, uh, then you can uh, you'll be uh, able to purchase your first home, um, and you can own up to three homes. And in those homes, you can decorate them however you want. And different homes have different costs depending on uh, the layout, uh, surface area, like how how many things can you put in your house. Uh, what's unique about houses is the minute you get one, it becomes a recall point for you as well. So instead of having to use uh, fast travel and its Azoth co cost, you can basically recall to your home and you can have up to three homes. And by the time you hit level 55 is when you can purchase your third house. Um, and then that also starts reducing the cooldown timer as well. So you can have the option to bounce back and forth across the map in that method and save some of that Azoth if you want to use it for... Uh, getting more benefits or buffs in your crafting, things like that. Right on. Tell me a bit more about this overthrowing a faction. I, I, that sounds pretty fun. Like, okay, so you, they're they're charging too much. There's taxation without representation, and what do you do? Like, how do you how do you overthrow this faction? So it could be other things too. It's like you know what I think. Our faction needs to own this territory because one of the benefits is, besides you know lower cost on things, is oh I can transfer goods from one settlement to another for a fee, like a smaller fee. So you start unlocking all these other benefits by owning multiple territories. And so what you'd want to do is you want to start doing PVP missions. You want to start doing things that are going to increase uh, your faction's influence uh, within that territory. And once you can get it maxed out, then you're able to declare war. And then once you're able to declare war on the territory, uh, then you'll be able to like, group up the best of your players to go into a 50 v 50 war against the defenders of that territory. And if you win, you ultimately get to take that over. And then the race begins again. Now you can try to slow it down by earning uh, influence yourself, but ultimately if you're fighting to control tons of different territories, you might want to focus on one or two, unless you're a much bigger company. What, um, what, what kind of scale are we looking at here? How many territories on the map? Let's see. I think there's 11 claimable territories right now. 
Uh, there's three that are in uh, control of corruption and uh, angry earth that are unclaimable. So you can't claim Shattered Mountain, Great Cleave, or Eden Grove at this time. They're just too hostile. Um, they have outposts in those regions that'll let you do a little bit of crafting and have a place to get quests, store some stuff, and and fast travel from. Uh, but 11 territories in total that you can you know fight over, and the more of the map that you control, the more benefits that you get. Uh, the same comes with the forts themselves. Like each fort that you claim has a different set of buffs, whether it's like uh, reduces equip load weight, uh, reduces costs on fast travel, or makes fast travel times uh, reduced. Uh, there's a whole bunch of just benefits from, from fighting over these things, in addition to increasing the rate of your influence gain within that territory. Um, so this will evolve obviously this will evolve over time how you know how does that look what what do you what are your what are the sort of the the big picture plans that you guys have for like the evolution of new world um this sort of ex game the the you know end 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 game experience as as people keep playing so right now we have uh, expeditions and they start at level 25 uh recommended level 25 and those are your like five player instance content uh, type of endeavors for PVE, and they go uh, 25, 35, 45, 55, and 60. And that's the that's the initial set of day one that you're going to play. Um, and then for uh, out in the open world, we have uh, breaches, corruption breaches. They're dynamic events that uh, occur all over a turnum, and they increase in level, and you'll fight uh, elite enemies as well within those where you can gain gear just like how you could in expeditions, uh, as well as we have elite POIs that exist out in the world. And those are like, almost think of them like an open world expedition where there's just much harder enemies, but they're they're bigger, more expansive experiences and they're not uh, like instance content. So they're more onion layered and multiple groups can go in at the same time. Uh, you also have Outpost Rush, which is our 20 v 20 uh, battle mode uh, for level 60 players. Will they also compete for uh, cash and prizes? And then you have the uh, invasions, uh, which take place. And usually you want your best and finest uh, fighting in those battles. And that's when corruption itself comes to take on uh, the residents of each territory. And they'll try to, if they win, they'll basically knock down uh, the entire territory is like level. So like you'll downgrade all your stations and you're going to have to redo all that progress to make sure like, oh, we need crafting stations up because we can't make this particular type of potion or I can't make weapons anymore. Or, My jewel crafting has been reduced to tier three. We need to hurry up and get on it. So uh, there's a lot of uh, dynamicism that revolves around just fighting off the forces of corruption. Uh, like I said, it's day one. Uh, this is just the initial offering and we're... We're busy. We're busy working on tons of new things. I can't say anything right now, but rest assured we're listening and we're building. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a lot of content. Um, it sounds like a, a pretty a pretty good time commitment. What do you what do you do for players who I mean, there are the you know, there are the players who are probably already like pretty high level because they're just, you know, diving in full bore. But what about more casual players? Um, you know, players who might only have you know, a couple hours a week to get into this. What what is the what's the path for these these types of players? It really depends how you want to play, and that's what I that's what I really love about our game. It's like you know what I just want to go out and be a blacksmith, and I don't really think I'm going to fight anybody. I'm like, well, you can do that. I mean, you can either purchase the gear or you can craft it yourself. So it's like I I got a nice mining pick, and I'm just going to go out and I'm going to hunt all the iron ore until I get really proficient at it and I'm going to smelt it all. And then I'm going to go and start creating, uh, you know, silver charms or necklaces, or I'm going to start developing like iron plate. There's so many different uh, pathing or, or crafts and trade skills along your progression path that you can choose to undertake with countless hours of, of just creating and evolving and finding new things that you can trade or sell uh, and just getting better at being like a blacksmith or, or even a fisherman. It's really chill to just go out and either freshwater or uh, ocean water fish. And just sometimes you'll get lucky and catch like a, a giant swordfish. And even luckier, you'll get a treasure chest full of gems and gold. Like there's so many different things that you could you could do. How does trading work? Like if you are a blacksmith and you create all these cool things, 
Like, how do you, how do you profit off of that? How do you, how do you um, engage with other players? So every settlement has a trading post. So you can go to, let's say in Winsward, I'm going to go up to their trading post and I have a whole bunch of gear and I'm just going to start posting uh, sell orders and see whoever's interested in all the gear that I'm making. Or say I'm part of a, a, a bigger company, I can start building gear for the people that I play with or or bags, like everyone loves bags. So I'm just going to build a ton of bags that have like uh, different types of perks or bonuses that like increase my total uh, encumbrance weight or my uh, equip load or uh, the amount of Azoth I can carry. There's so many different options that you have, like going down one of those paths. One of the things I wanted to touch on too, it's because we're classless, like your weapon becomes part of your identity and your class, but you can change it at any time. So like uh, I remember in one of the beta periods, I was like, you know what? I want to try magic casting for a while. So I went fire staff and ice gauntlet and I, I rolled like that the entire time. And so I built into like separate trees, played the way that I wanted to play and then adjusted my attributes and my gear based upon that. And then I was like, you know what? I want to switch it up. Not a problem. I would just switch out my weapons and start looking and hunting for different gear and it's a use uh, to progress kind of system. So the, the more that I use that thing, uh, the more proficient at it I get. And then I get to select what abilities and what passives I want to take with me on that journey. And you can respec at any time. Like after level 20, there's a gold cost. But you can, you can choose, you know, one day I want to be a blacksmith and, and, uh, and I want to invest in a uh, sword and board because I want to tank as well. Or... You know, the next day I'm just going to be, you know, I'm going to be the best mage out there. So up to level 20, though, you can just do that free of charge. Yeah, we let uh, players just experiment, kind of figure out, you know, what is their play style? And then after that, there's a a modest gold cost. Okay. Um, So on a on a sort of the business side of things, what is what is uh, the, the the revenue model here? How does this work? I mean, we've got so many different kinds of MMOs out there that are free to play. There's subscription based how how does this how does this game work you buy the game one time purchase for the game it's uh I, I don't know all the territories like with pounds but us dollars is uh, 39 dollars for the base game and i believe it's 49 dollars for the deluxe edition which comes with some additional skins and marks of fortune stuff like that and then there's uh mtx inside the game for cosmetic goods so just different weapon skins, armor sets, things like that. Okay. Um, there's no so there's no monthly subscription. There's no monthly subscription. Okay. But if you if you link your game to Prime Gaming, like I think your Steam account, if you link it to Prime Gaming, uh, we have Prime Gaming events, we have Twitch drop events. So just having those things linked and and watching streams that have drops enabled, you can get some really cool gear. That's cool. Um, is there going to be, um, I guess I know we already kind of touched on future stuff, but is there, is there going to be like a seasonal right now? So many games have, you know, seasons. Is that a, is that a thing that's going to happen with, with new world or is it just kind of going to be an ongoing, um, I don't, I don't know what you'd call it without seasons. Uh, There's nothing I can discuss right now, but we're looking at like, you know, whatever options are best for the players, like whatever they want to experience, or those are things that we want to dive into and, and make sure that, you know, everyone finds their fun from the, the super casual to the hardcore. Like we want a term to be like a, a big community and hopefully scratch those itches that you have to go out, what, what, and, you know, adventure. What are you seeing from the community right now? Now that, it, you know, it's been out a whole day, but uh, you know, what's, what's the, what's the reaction you've been seeing? Oh man, it, it changes with every release. Like uh, the the last release, what I thought was amazing was uh, the VoIP chat because we have area VoIP chat. And I I saw someone basically serenading a town square singing. I'm going to butcher it again. It was, it, it was either in sync or 98 degrees, one of those. <laughs> and they got to the chorus and they paused. And everyone that was in the town square just chimed in at the same time. And I thought it was absolutely amazing. It was hilarious. So it's moments like that uh, that I was finding really rewarding. Uh, But what I've been seeing is lots of expedition runs, uh, which I've been having a lot of fun with. Uh, Certain people are just like really hardcore into like, uh, the faction missions and going through that kind of like progression line. Other people are super big into fishing. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I love seeing the crafting and just the, the different types of uh, 
outfits that I see now. It's like after you, after you progress off the starting beach and people start really getting gear and, and, and the variation just starts happening organically and people start getting dyes and you see tons of interesting things. And then there's some really hardcore after, you know, a day that we're actually able to purchase houses. And I'm hoping to see the the same kinds of things that we saw during uh, our beta periods where you see these elaborate houses. I saw one person converted their first floor into a full bar. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Sounds like my kind of house. Um, <laughs> how, so how does so? There's quite a, quite a few customization options for houses. Like like, what kind of variety in in housing are we talking about here? So there's different layouts and different sizes and different aesthetics depending on what territory you're in. So you'll get more of like a like like a Caribbean kind of vibe when you're in say like a, like First Light, uh, and then you go to Reek Water. And it's it's kind of like a, a swamp village built into the trees, a Swiss Family Robinson kind of feel to it. Uh, every every place has its own like unique vibe. Um, and then the same is true of like the furnishings that you can get. There's like uh, pirate inspired, corruption inspired, uh, lost inspired, uh, different types of settlers, different just types of furnishings. So you can kind of decorate it however you see fit. Like, no, I want a bunk bed in here or an armoire <laughs> or, or I found a painting. I'm just going to put it up on the wall. That's cool. Um, in terms of uh, just sort of the, the overarching narrative of, of New World, um, do you mind? I guess we're, I'm getting totally backwards here. I should have talked about this first. But what is the story um, of the game? Like when, you, when you're first getting into the, uh, as a player, you find this, this, this New World, obviously, a term. Um, what's, what's going on? What's the corruption? What is the, what is the sort of... Uh, the the big story. So a big story as the player, uh, you're just a, a crew member aboard a ship and it happens to be the ship of captain Thorpe. And during the travels, you enter this storm, this seawall, um, and you crash into the eternal isle. And what you discover is you didn't die and nothing really dies in this place. Uh, and so you're trying to kind of figure out, okay, what's going on? We, we made it to this place, but it's not as, you know, what I thought it was going to be. Um, and your captain dies on you uh, and then subsequently tries to murder you. Um, so then you, you, you find yourself uh, trying to su survive with a whole bunch of other people that have made it to a tournament. And you find that it's not just, you know, this, the current time period, but it's been over a millennia that different cultures and different people have discovered this place. Uh, and it might've been known by different names. It could have been like Avalon or Shangri-La uh, or even Atlantis. It, it's this, this lost place of myth and legend. And so we'd like to think of it as a place where myth and legends are true. And what you're slowly starting to discover is that, yeah, there's, there's this place and there's this power that's here, but there's this other power that's, twisted and it's become corrupt and is kind of growing an army and so the narrative is really you finding your place in this world and against this fight against this growing force of corruption uh there's tons of side stories that talk about the people that you know have lived here for a while and and what they've had to do to survive and some of their folly and some of their you know laughter and comedic elements that have happened um so you get little tidbits of backstory and then personality of of the places and things that you know make up this world. Uh, what I love is that you also have this separate track from that. So you have the this narrative that kind of like drives like you know the heartbeat of a uh at its core, and then you have this social narrative track. And that's just starting to grow. And that happened yesterday. And that's with the people that play the game and that are fighting for control of it. And so I'm really interested to see how those faction narratives differ from world to world and, and what those outcomes are. So I, I'm pretty interested to see how players deal with uh, their uh, diplomacy and negotiation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um because it does sound like there's quite a bit of sort of, of player input with, you know, with factions and PVE and PVP and uh, housing and everything else. 
trade too. Like you said that there's uh, an element of trade where you can lower prices to trade goods between settlements and whatnot. So that's sort of a macroeconomic <laughs> element to it as well. That's cool. Um, well, great. Uh, well, thank you so much for taking time to talk with me about the game today and congratulations on the launch, which seems pretty epic so far. So uh, yeah, appreciate you. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Well, great. Well, um, good luck with the rest of your um, extremely busy week, probably extremely busy few weeks. Um, and yeah, I look forward to jumping in the game some more and playing some more. And um, yeah, take care. Again, on the track.